Account of the Cherokee Nation By James Adair We shall now treat of the Cherig Nation as the next neighbor to South Carolina. Their national name is derived from Chira, fire, which is their reputed lower heaven, and hence they call their magi, Chirataj, men possessed of the divine fire. The country lies in about 34 degrees north latitude, at the distance of 340 computed miles to the northwest of Charlestown, 140 miles west-southwest from the Catawba Nation, and almost 200 miles to the north of the Muscogee or Creek country. They are settled, nearly in an east and west course, about 140 miles in length from the lower towns where Fort Prince George stands, to the late unfortunate Fort Loudoun. The natives make two divisions of their country, which they term Arate and Atar, signifying low and mountainous. The former division is on the head branches of the beautiful Savannah River, and the latter on those of the easternmost river of the Great Mississippi. Their towns are always close to some river or creek, as there the land is commonly very level and fertile, on account of the frequent washings off the mountains and the moisture it receives from the waters that run through their fields and such a situation enables them to perform the ablutions connected with their religious worship. The eastern, or lower parts of this country, are sharp and cold to a Carolinian in winter, and yet agreeable, but those towns that lie among the Appalock Mountains are very pinching to such who are unaccustomed to a savage life. The ice and snow continue on the north side, till late in the spring of the year, however, the natives are well provided for it, by their bathing and anointing themselves. This regimen shuts up the pores of the body, and by that means prevents too great a perspiration, and an accustomed exercise of hunting, joined with the former, puts them far above their climate, they are almost as impenetrable to cold as a bar of steel, and the severest cold is no detriment to their hunting. Formerly, the Chirake were a very numerous and potent nation. Not above forty years ago, they had sixty-four towns and villages, populous, and full of women and children. According to the computations of the most intelligent old traders of that time, they amounted to upwards of 6,000 fighting men, a prodigious number to have so close on our settlements, defended by blue-topped ledges of inaccessible mountains, where, but three of them can make a successful campaign, even against their own watchful red-color enemies. But they were then simple and peaceable to what they are now. As their western, or upper towns, which are situated among the Appalock Mountains, on the eastern branches of the Mississippi, were always engaged in hot war with the more northern Indians, and the middle and lower towns in constant hostility with the Muscogee, till reconciled by a governor of South Carolina for the sake of trade, several of their best towns, on the southern branch of Savannah River, are now forsaken and destroyed, as Ishtato, Ekia, Tagalo, and and they are brought into a narrower compass. At the conclusion of our last war with them, the traders calculated the number of their warriors to consist of about 2,300, which is a great diminution for so short a space of time, and if we may conjecture for futurity, from the circumstances already past, there will be few of them alive, after the like revolution of time. Their towns are still scattered wide of each other, because the land will not admit any other settlement, it is a rare thing to see a level tract of 400 acres. They are also strongly attached to rivers, all retaining the opinion of the ancients that rivers are necessary to constitute a paradise. Nor is it only ornamental, but likewise beneficial to them on account of purifying themselves and also for the services of common life, such as fishing, fowling, and killing of deer, which come in the warm season to eat the saltish moss and grass, which grow on the rocks, and under the surface of the waters. Their rivers are generally very shallow and pleasant to the eye, for the land being high, the waters have a quick descent, they seldom overflow their banks, unless when a heavy rain falls on a deep snow. Then, it is frightful to see the huge pieces of ice, mixed with a prodigious torrent of water, rolling down the high mountains and over the steep craggy rocks, so impetuous that nothing can resist their force. Two old traders saw an instance of this kind, which swept away great plantations of oaks and pines that had their foundation as in the center of the earth. It overset several of the higher rocks, where the huge rafts of trees and ice had stopped up the main channel and forced itself across through the smaller hills. 
From the historical descriptions of the Alps and a personal view of the Chirag Mountains, I conclude the Alps of Italy are much inferior to several of the Chirag Mountains, both in height and rockiness. The last are also of a prodigious extent and frequently impassable by an enemy. The Allegheny, or Great Blue Ridge, commonly called the Appalach Mountains, are here above a hundred miles broad, and by the best accounts we can get from the Mississippi Indians, run along between Peru and Mexico, unless where the large rivers occasion a break. They stretch also all the way from the west of the northern Great Lakes, near Hudson's Bay, and across the Mississippi, about 250 leagues above New Orleans. In the lower and middle parts of this mountainous ragged country, the Indians have a convenient passable path by the foot of the mountains, but farther in, they are of such a prodigious height that they are forced to wend from north to south along the rivers and large creeks to get a safe passage, and the paths are so steep in many places that the horses often pitch and rear an end to scramble up. Several of the mountains are some miles from bottom to top, according to the ascent of the paths, and there are other mountains I have seen from these, when out with the Indians in clear weather, that the eye can but faintly discern, which therefore must be at a surprising distance. Where the land is capable of cultivation, it would produce anything suitable to the climate. Hemp and wine grapes grow there to admiration, they have plenty of the former, and a variety of the latter that grow spontaneously. If these were properly cultivated, there must be a good return. I have gathered good hops in the woods opposite to Nuquos, where our troops were repelled by the Chirake in the year 1760. There is not a more healthful region under the sun than this country, for the air is commonly open and clear, and plenty of wholesome and pleasant water. I know several bold rivers that fill themselves in running about 30 miles, counting by a direct course from their several different fountains, and which are almost as transparent as glass. The natives live commonly to a great age, which is not to be wondered at, when we consider the high situation of their country, the exercise they pursue, the richness of the soil that produces plenty for a needful support of life, without fatiguing or overheating the planters, the advantages they receive from such excellent good water as gushes out of every hill, and the great additional help by a plain abstemious life, commonly eating and drinking only according to the solicitations of nature. I have seen strangers, however, full of admiration at beholding so few old people in that country, and they have concluded from thence, and reported in the English settlements, that it was a sickly short-lived region, but we should consider, they are always involved in treacherous wars, and exposed to perpetual dangers, by which, infirm and declining people generally fall, and the manly old warrior will not shrink. And yet many of the peaceable fellows, and women, especially in the central towns, see the gray hairs of their children long before they die, and in every Indian country there are a great many old women on the frontiers, perhaps ten times the number of the men of the same age and place, which plainly shows the country to be healthy. Those reach to a great age, who live secure by the fireside, but no climates or constitutions can harden the human body and make it bulletproof. The Chirag country abounds with the best herbage on the richer parts of the hills and mountains, and a great variety of valuable herbs is promiscuously scattered on the lower lands. It is remarkable that none of our botanists should attempt making any experiments there, notwithstanding the place invited their attention, and the public had a right to expect so generous an undertaking from several of them, while at the same time they would be recovering or renewing their health at a far easier, cheaper, and safer rate than coasting it to our northern colonies. On the level parts of the waterside, between the hills, there are plenty of reeds, and, formerly, such places abounded with great breaks of winter canes. The foliage of which is always green, and hearty food for horses and cattle. The traders used to raise their flocks of an hundred and a hundred fifty excellent horses, which are commonly of a good size, well-made, hard-hoofed, handsome, strong and fit for the saddle or draft, but a person runs too great a risk to buy any to take them out of the country, because every spring season most of them make for their native range. Before the Indian trade was ruined by our left-handed policy, and the natives were corrupted by the liberality of our dim-sighted politicians, the Chirake were frank, sincere, and industrious. Their towns then abounded with hogs, poultry, and everything sufficient for the support of a reasonable life, which the traders purchased at an easy rate, 
to their mutual satisfaction, and as they kept them busily employed, and did not make themselves too cheap, the as the Chirag began to have goods at an underprice, it tempted them to be both proud and lazy. Their women and children are now far above taking the trouble to raise hogs for the ugly white people, as the beautiful red heroes proudly term them. If any do, they are forced to feed them in small pens or enclosures through all the crop season and chiefly on long parsley and other wholesome weeds that their rich fields abound with. But at the fall of the leaf, the woods are full of hickory nuts, acorns, chestnuts, and the like, which occasions the Indian bacon to be more streaked, firm, and better tasted than any we meet with in the English settlements. Some of the natives are grown fond of horned cattle, both in the Chirake and Muscogee countries, but most decline them because the fields are not regularly fenced. But almost everyone hath horses, from two to a dozen, which makes a considerable number through their various nations. The Chirake had a prodigious number of excellent horses at the beginning of their late war with us, but pinching hunger forced them to eat the greatest part of them in the time of that unfortunate event. But as all are now become very active and sociable, they will soon supply themselves with plenty of the best sort from our settlements. They are skillful jockeys and nice in their choice. From the head of the southern branch of Savannah River, it does not exceed half a mile to a head spring of the Mississippi water that runs through the middle and upper parts of the Chirag Nation, about a northwest course, and joining other rivers, they empty themselves into the great Mississippi. The above fountain is called Herbert's Spring, and it was natural for strangers to drink thereof, to quench thirst, gratify their curiosity, and have it to say they had drank of the French waters. Some of our people, who went only with the view of staying a short time, but by some allurement or other, exceeded the time appointed at their return, reported either through merriment or superstition, that the spring had such a natural bewitching quality that whosoever drank of it could not possibly quit the nation during the tedious space of seven years. All the debauches readily fell in with this superstitious notion as an excuse for their bad method of living when they had no proper call to stay in that country, and in process of time, it became as received a truth as any ever believed to have been spoken by the Delphic Oracle. One cursed, because its enchantment had marred his good fortune, another condemned his weakness for drinking down witchcraft against his own secret suspicions, one swore he would never taste again such known dangerous poison, even though he should be forced to do down to the Mississippi for water, and another comforted himself that so many years out of the seven were already passed, and wished that if ever he tasted it again, though under the greatest necessity, he might be confined. To the Stygian Waters those who had their minds more enlarged diverted themselves much at their cost, for it was a noted favorite place, on account of the name it went by, and being a well-situated and good spring, there all travelers commonly drank a bottle of choice, but now most of the pack horsemen, though they be dry, and also matchless sons. Of Bacchus, on the most pressing invitations to drink there, would swear to forfeit sacred liquor the better part of their lives, rather than basely renew, or confirm the loss of their liberty, which that execrable fountain occasions. So named from an early commissioner of Indian affairs. Major. John Herbert, who made a map of the Cherokee country in 1715. In January of that year, he accompanied Colonel. George Chicken on a journey towards the Tennessee country, which Chicken journalized. Describing the spot, he wrote, we come to ye top of ye mountain, and there we see the haid of a river that roams into Chattahousee River. About a mile on ye other side of ye mountain, they begin ye haid of another river that roams into Mississippi. Our march this day was forty miles. We come to Quanishi, however, after five o'clock where ye river that we see, ye haid of was very broad. Charleston Yearbook for 1894, page. 315, about the year 1738, the Chirake received a most depopulating shock by the smallpox, which reduced them almost one half in about a year's time. It was conveyed into Charlestown by the Guinea men, and soon after among them by the infected goods. At first, it made slow advances, and as it was a foreign, and to them a strange disease, they were so deficient in proper skill that they alternately applied a regimen of hot and cold things to those who were infected. 
The old magi and religious physicians who were consulted on so alarming a crisis reported the sickness had been set among them on account of the adulterous intercourses of their young married people who the past year had in a most notorious manner violated their ancient laws of marriage in every thicket and broke down and polluted many of the honest neighbors' bean plots by their heinous crimes, which would cost a great deal of trouble to purify again. To those flagitious crimes they ascribed the present disease as a necessary effect of the divine anger, and indeed the religious men chanced to suffer the most in their small fields, as being contiguous to the townhouse, where they usually met at night to dance, when their corn was out of the stocks, upon this peak they showed their priestcraft. However, it was thought needful on this occasion to endeavor to put a stop to the progress of such a dangerous disease, and as it was believed to be brought on them by their unlawful copulation in the night dews, it was thought most practicable to try to effect a cure under the same cool element. Immediately, they ordered the reputed sinners to lie out of doors, day and night, with their breasts frequently open to the night dews, to cool the fever, they were likewise afraid that the diseased would otherwise pollute the house, and by that means, procure all their deaths. Instead of applying warm remedies, they at last in every visit poured cold water on their naked breasts, sang their religious mystical song, yo-yo, etc. With a doleful tune, and shaked a calabash with the pebble stones over the sick, using a great many frantic gestures by way of incantation. From the reputed cause of the disease, we may rationally conclude their physical treatment of it to be of a true old Jewish descent, for as the Israelites invoked the deity or asked a blessing on everything they undertook, so all the Indian Americans seek for it, according on the remaining faint glimpse of their tradition. When they found their theological regimen had not the desired effect, but that the infection gained upon them, they held a second consultation, and deemed it the best method to sweat their patients, and plunge them into the river, which was accordingly done. Their rivers being very cold in summer, by reason of the numberless springs, which pour from the hills and mountains, and the pores of their bodies being open to receive the cold, it rushing in through the whole frame, they immediately expired, upon which all the magi and prophetic tribe broke their old consecrated physic pots, and threw away all the other pretended holy things they had for physical use, imagining they had lost their divine power by being polluted, and shared the common. Fate of their country a great many killed themselves, for being naturally proud, they are always peeping into their looking glasses, and are never genteelly dressed, according to their mode, without carrying one hung over their shoulders, by which means, seeing themselves disfigured, without hope of regaining their former beauty, some shot themselves, others cut their throats, some stabbed themselves with knives, and others with sharp-pointed canes. Many threw themselves with sullen madness into the fire and there slowly expired, as if they had been utterly divested of the native power of feeling pain. I remember, in Timace, one of their towns, about ten miles above the present Fort Prince George, a great head warrior, who murdered a white man thirty miles below Chiohi, as was proved by the branded deer skins he produced afterward, when he saw himself disfigured by the smallpox, he chose to die, that he might end as he imagined his shame. When his relations knew his desperate design, they narrowly watched him, and took away every sharp instrument from him. When he found he was balked of his intention, he fretted and said the worst things their language could express, and showed all the symptoms of a desperate person enraged at his disappointment, and forced to live and see his ignominy, he then darted himself against the wall, with all his remaining vigor, his strength being expended by the force of his friend's opposition, he fell sullenly on the bed as if by those violent struggles he was overcome, and wanted to repose himself. His relations through tenderness left him to his rest, but as soon as they went away, he raised himself, and after a tedious search, finding nothing but a thick and round hoe held, he took the fatal instrument, and having fixed one end of it in the ground, he repeatedly threw himself on it, till he forced it down his throat, when he immediately expired. He was buried in silence, without the least mourning. Although the Chirak showed such little skill in curing the smallpox, yet they, as well as all other Indian nations, have a great knowledge of specific virtues and simples, applying herbs and plants on the most dangerous occasions, and seldom, if ever, fail to effect a thorough cure from the natural bush. 
In the order of nature, every country and climate is blessed with specific remedies for the maladies that are kind natural to it. Naturalists tell us they have observed that when the wild goat's sight begins to decay, he rubs his head against a thorn, and by some effluvia, or virtue in the vegetable, the sight is renewed. Thus the snake only disfigure, but disable the poor man the rest of his life, that there would have been more humanity in cutting off the head than in such a barbarous amputation, because it is much better for men to die once than to be always dying, for when the hand is lost, how can the poor man feed himself by his daily labor, by the same rule of physic, had he been wounded in his head, our surgeons should have cut that off, for being unfortunate. I told the benevolent old warriors that the wisdom of our laws had exempted the head from such severe treatment by not settling a reward for severing it, but only so much for every joint of the branches of the body, which might be well enough spared without the life, and that this medical treatment was a strong certificate to recommend the poor man to genteel lodgings, where numbers belonging to our great canoes were provided for during life. They were of opinion, however, that such brave hardy fellows would rather be deemed men and work for their bread than be laid aside, not only as useless animals, but as burdens to the rest of society. I do not remember to have seen or heard of an Indian dying by the bite of a snake when out at war or a hunting, although they are then often bitten by the most dangerous snakes everyone carries in his shot pouch, a piece of the best snake root, such as the Seneca or fern snake root, or the wild whorehound, wild plantain, st. Andrew's cross, and a variety of other herbs and roots, which are plenty and well known to those who range the American woods and are exposed to such dangers and will affect a thorough and speedy cure if timely applied. When an Indian perceives he is struck by a snake, he immediately chews some of the root, and having swallowed a sufficient quantity of it, he applies some to the wound, which he repeats as occasion requires, and in proportion to the poison the snake has infused into the wound. For a short space of time, there is a terrible conflict through all the body, by the jarring qualities of the burning poison and the strong antidote, but the poison is soon repelled through the same channels it entered, and the patient is cured. The Chirag Mountains look very formidable to a stranger when he is among their valleys, encircled with their prodigious, proud, contending tops. They appear as a great mass of black and blue clouds, interspersed with some rays of light. But they produce, or contain everything for health and wealth, and if cultivated by the rules of art, would furnish perhaps as valuable medicines as the eastern countries, and as great quantities of gold and silver as Peru and Mexico, in proportion to their situation with the equator. On the tops of several of those mountains, I have observed tufts of grass deeply tinctured by the mineral exhalations from the earth, and on the sides, they glistered from the same cause. If skillful alchemists made experiments on these mountains, they could soon satisfy themselves as to the value of their contents and probably would find their account in it. Within twenty miles of the late Fort Loudon, there is great plenty of whetstones for razors of red, white, and black colors. The silver mines are so rich that by digging about ten yards deep, some desperate vagrants found at sundry times so much rich ore as to enable them to counterfeit dollars to a great amount, a horse load of which was detected in passing for the purchase of Negroes at Augusta, which stands on the south side of the meandering beautiful Savannah River, halfway from the Chirate country to Savannah, the capital of Georgia. The lodestone is likewise found there, but they have no skill in searching for it, only on the surface, a great deal of the magnetic power is lost, as being exposed to the various changes of the weather and frequent firing of the woods. I was told by a trader, who lives in the upper parts of the Chirate country, which is surrounded, on every side, by prodigious piles of mountains called Chiohi, that within about a mile of the town of that name, there is a hill with a great plenty of lodestones. The truth of this any gentleman of curiosity may soon ascertain, as it lies on the northern path that leads from South Carolina to the remains of Fort Loudon, and while he is in search of this, he may at the same time make a great quest of riches, for the lodestone is known to accompany rich metals. I was once near that lodestone hill, but the heavy rains which at that time fell on the deep snow prevented the gratifying my curiosity as the boggy deep creek was thereby rendered impassable. In this rocky country are found a great many beautiful, clear, 
crystalline stones formed by nature into several angles, which commonly meet in one point. Several of them are transparent, like a coarse diamond, others resemble the onyx, being engendered of black and thick humors, as we see water that is tinctured with ink, still keeping its surface clear. I found one stone like a ruby, as big as the top of a man's thumb, with a beautiful dark shade in the middle of it. Many stones of various colors and beautiful luster may be collected on the tops of those hills and mountains, which if skillfully managed, would be very valuable, for some of them are clear and very hard. From which, we may rationally conjecture that a quantity of subterranean treasures is contained there. The Spaniards generally found out their southern mines by such superficial indications and it would be a useful and profitable service for skillful artists to engage in, as the present trading white savages are utterly ignorant of it. Manifold curious works of the wise author of nature are bountifully dispersed through the whole of the country, obvious to every curious eye. Among the mountains are many labyrinths, and some of a great length, with many branches and various windings, likewise different sorts of mineral waters, the qualities of which are unknown to the natives, as by their temperate way of living and the healthiness of their country, they have no occasion to make experiments in them. Between the heads of the northern branch of the lower Chirik River and the heads of that of Tukasechi, Winding round in a long course by the late Fort Loudon and afterwards into the Mississippi, there is, both in the nature and circumstances, a great phenomenon between two high mountains nearly covered with old mossy rocks, lofty cedars, and pines, and the valleys of which the beams of the sun reflect a powerful heat, there are, as the natives affirm, some bright old inhabitants, or rattlesnakes, of a more enormous size than is mentioned in history. They are so large and unwieldy that they take a circle, almost as wide as their length, to crawl around in their shortest orbit, but bountiful nature compensates the heavy motion of their bodies, for as they say, no living creature moves within the reach of their sight, but they can draw it to them, which is agreeable to what we observe, through the whole system of animated beings. Nature endues them with proper capacities to sustain life, as they cannot support themselves by their speed or cunning to spring from an ambuscade, it is needful they should have the bewitching craft of their eyes and forked tongues. The description the Indians give us of their color is as various as what we are told of the chameleon that seems to the spectator to change its color by every different position he may view it in, which proceeds from the piercing rays of light that blaze from their foreheads so as to dazzle the eyes from whatever quarter they post themselves, for in each of their heads there is a large carbuncle which not only repels, but they affirm, sullies the meridian beams of the sun. They reckon it so dangerous to disturb those creatures that no temptation can induce them to betray their secret recess to the profane. They call them and all of the rattlesnake kind, kings, or chieftains of the snakes, and they allow one such to every different species of the brute creation. An old trader of Chio he told me that for the reward of two pieces of stroud cloth, he engaged a couple of young warriors to show him the place of their resort, but the headmen would not by any means allow it, on account of a superstitious tradition, for they fancy the killing of them would expose them to the danger of being bit by the other inferior species of that serpentine tribe who love their chieftains, and know by instinct those who maliciously killed them as they fight only. In their own defense, and that of their young ones, never biting those who do not disturb them. Although they esteem those rattlesnakes as chieftains of that species, yet they do not deify them, as the Egyptians did all the serpentine kind, and likewise Ibis, that preyed upon them. However, it seems to have sprung from the same origin, for I once saw the Chikasa Archimagus to chew some snake root, blow it on his hands, and then take up a rattlesnake without damage. Soon afterwards he laid it down carefully in a hollow tree, lest I should have killed it. Once on the Chikasa trading warpath, a little above the country of the Muscogee, as I was returning to camp from hunting, I found in a large cane swamp a fellow traveler, an old Indian trader, inebriated and naked, except his Indian breeches and moccasins, in that habit he sat, holding a great rattlesnake round the neck, with his left hand besmeared with proper roots, and with the other applying the roots to the teeth, in order to repel the poison before he drew them out which having effected, he laid it down tenderly at a distance. I then killed it, to his great dislike, as he was afraid it would occasion misfortunes to himself and me. 
I told him, as he had taken away its teeth, common pity should induce one to put it out of misery, and that a charitable action could never bring ill on anyone, but his education prevented his fears from subsiding. On a Christmas day, at the trading house of that harmless, brave, but unfortunate man, I took the foot of a guinea deer out of his shot pouch, and another from my own partner, which they had very safely sewed in the corner of each of their otter skin pouches the Chikasa country, and when the rest of the trading people and all our horses were gone down to the English settlements, I persuaded the Chakta to take up the bloody tomahawk against those perfidious French, in revenge of a long train of crying blood, and had it not been for the self-interested policy of a certain governor, those numerous savages, with the warlike Chikasa, would have destroyed the Mississippi settlements, root and branch, except those who kept themselves closely. Confined in Garrison when I treat of the Chakta country, I shall more particularly relate that very material affair. The superior policy of the French so highly intoxicated the lightheads of the Chirake that they were plotting mischief for twenty years before we forced them to commit hostilities. The illustration of this may divert the reader and show our southern colonies what they may still expect from the masterly abilities of the French Louisianians whenever they can make it suit their interest to exert their talents among the Indian nations while our watchmen are only employed in treating on paper in our far distant capital seats of government. In the year 1736, the French sent into South Carolina one priber a gentleman of a curious and speculative temper. He was to transmit them a full account of that country and proceed to the Chirag nation in order to seduce them from the British to the French interest. He went, and though he was adorned with every qualification that constitutes the gentleman, soon after he arrived at the upper towns of this mountainous country, he exchanged his clothes and everything he brought with him, and by that means made friends with the head warriors of Great Tilico, which stood on a branch of the Mississippi. More effectually to answer the design of his commission, he ate, drank, slept, danced, dressed, and painted himself with the Indians, so that it was not easy to distinguish him from the natives, he married also with them, and being ended with a strong understanding and retentive memory, he soon learned their dialect, and by gradual advances, impressed them with a very ill opinion of the English, representing them as a fraudulent, avaricious, and encroaching people, he at the same time inflated the artless savages with a prodigious high opinion of their own importance in the American scale of power on account of the situation of their country, their martial disposition, and the great number of their warriors, which would baffle all the efforts of the ambitious and ill-designing British colonists. Having thus infected them by his smooth deluding art, he easily formed them into a nominal republican government, crowned their old Archimagus emperor after a pleasing new savage form, and invented a variety of high-sounding titles for all the members of his imperial majesty's red court and the great officers of state, which the emperor conferred upon them in a manner according to their merit. He himself received the honorable title of his imperial majesty's principal secretary of state, and as such he subscribed himself and all the letters he wrote to our government and lived in open defiance of them. This seemed to be of so dangerous a tendency as to induce South Carolina to send up a commissioner, Colonel F. X., to demand him as an enemy to the public repose, who took him into custody in the great square of their state house, when he had almost concluded his oration on the occasion, one of the head warriors rose up and bade him forbear, as the man he intended to enslave was made a great beloved man and become one of their own people. Though it was reckoned our agent's strength was far greater in his arms than his head, he readily desisted, for as it is too hard to struggle with the Pope in Rome, a stranger could not miss to find it equally difficult to enter abruptly into a new emperor's court and there seize his prime minister by a foreign authority, especially when he could not support any charge of guilt against him. The warrior told him that the red people well knew the honesty of the secretary's heart would never allow him to tell a lie, and the secretary urged that he was a foreigner, without owing any allegiance to Great Britain, that he only traveled through some places of their country, in a peaceable manner, paying for everything he had of them, that in compliance with the request of the kindly French, as well as from his own tender feelings for the poverty and insecure state of the Chirac. He came a great way, 
and lived among them as a brother, only to preserve their liberties, by opening a water communication between them and New Orleans, that the distance of the two places from each other proved his motive to be the love of doing good, especially as he was to go there, and bring up a sufficient number of Frenchmen of proper skill to instruct them in the art of making gunpowder, the materials of which he affirmed their lands abounded with. He concluded his artful speech by urging that the tyrannical design of the English commissioner toward him appeared plainly to be leveled against them, because, as he was not accused of having done any ill to the English, before he came to the Chirake, his crime must consist in loving the Chirake. And as that was reckoned so heinous a transgression in the eye of the English, as to send one of their angry beloved men to enslave him, it confirmed all those honest speeches he had often spoken to the present great war chieftains, old beloved men, and warriors of each class. An old war leader repeated to the commissioner the essential part of the speech, and added more of his own similar thereto. He bade him to inform his superiors that the Chirake were as desirous as the English to continue a friendly union with each other as freemen and equals, that they hoped to receive no further uneasiness from them for consulting their own interests as their reason dictated, and they earnestly requested them to send no more of those bad papers to their country on any account, nor to reckon them so base as to allow any of their honest friends to be taken out of their arms and carried into slavery. The English beloved man had the honor of receiving his leave of absence and a sufficient passport of safe conduct from the Imperial Red Court by a verbal order of the Secretary of State, who was so polite as to wish him well home, and ordered a convoy of his own lifeguards, who conducted him a considerable way, and he got home in safety. From the above, it is evident that the monopolizing spirit of the French had planned their dangerous lines of circumvallation respecting our envied colonies as early as the before-mentioned period. The choice of the man bespeaks also their judgment. Though the philosophic secretary was an utter stranger to the wild and mountainous Chiray country, as well as to their language, yet his sagacity readily directed him to choose a proper place and an old favorite religious man for the new red empire, which he formed by slow but sure degrees to the great danger of our southern colonies. But the empire received a very great shock in an accident that befell the secretary when it was on the point of rising into a far greater state of puissance by the acquisition of the Muscogee, Chacta, and the western Mississippi Indians. In the fifth year of that red imperial era, he set off for Mobile, accompanied by a few Chirik. He proceeded by land, as far as a navigable part of the western great river of the Muscogee, there he went into a canoe prepared for the joyful occasion, and proceeded within a day's journey of Alabama garrison, conjecturing the adjacent towns were under the influence of the French, he landed at Tallapus town, and lodged there all night. The traders of the neighboring towns soon went there, convinced the inhabitants of the dangerous tendency of his unwearied labors among the Chirik and of his present journey, and then took him into custody with a large bundle of manuscripts and sent him down to Frederica in Georgia. The governor committed him to a place of confinement, though not with common felons, as he was a foreigner, and was said to have held a place of considerable rank in the army with great honor. Soon after, the magazine took fire, which was not far from where he was confined, and though the sentinels bade him make off to a place of safety, as all the people were running to avoid danger from the explosion of the powder and shells, yet he squatted on his belly upon the floor, and continued in that position, without the least hurt. Several blamed his rashness, but he told them that experience had convinced him it was the most probable means to avoid imminent danger. This incident displayed the philosopher and soldier, and after bearing his misfortunes a considerable time with great constancy, happily for us, he died in confinement, though he deserved a much better fate. In the first year of his secretaryship, I maintained a correspondence with him, but the Indians becoming very inquisitive to know the contents of our marked large papers, and he suspecting his memory might fail him in telling those cunning sisters of truth a plausible story, and of being able to repeat it often to them, without any variation, he took the shortest and safest method by telling them that, in the very same manner as he was their great secretary, I was the devil's clerk or an accursed one who marked on paper the bad speech of the evil ones of darkness. Accordingly, they forbade him writing any more to such an accursed one, or receiving any of his evil marked papers, and our correspondence ceased.
as he was learned and possessed of a very sagacious penetrating judgment and had every qualification that was requisite for his bold and difficult enterprise, it is not to be doubted that as he wrote a chirate dictionary designed to be published at Paris, he likewise set down a great deal that would have been very acceptable to the curious and serviceable to the representatives of South Carolina and Georgia, which may be readily found in Frederica if the manuscripts have had the Good fortune to escape the despoiling hands of military power. When the western Chirake towns lost the chief support of their imperial court, they artfully agreed to inform the English traders that each of them had opened their eyes and rejected the French plan as a wild scheme and had resolved to remove and settle so low down their river as the French boats could readily bring them a supply. But the hot war they fell into with the northern Indians made them postpone the execution of that favorite design, and the settling of Fort Loudon quieted them a little, as they expected to get presents and spirituous liquors there, according to the manner of the French promises, of which they had great plenty. The French, to draw off the western towns, had given them repeated assurances of settling a strong garrison on the north side of their river, as high up as their large petty augers could be brought with safety, where there was a large tract of rich lands abounding with game and fowl, and the river with fish. They at the same time promised to procure a firm peace between the Chirake and all the Indian nations depending on the French, and to bestow on them powder, bullets, flints, knives, scissors, combs, shirts, looking glasses, and red paint, beside favorite trifles to the fair sex, and the same brotherly man of the Alabama French extended their kindly hands to their Muscogee brethren. By their assiduous endeavors, that artful plan was well supported, and though the situation of our affairs, in the remote and leading Chirig towns, had been in a ticklish situation from the time their project of an empire was formed, and though several other towns became uneasy and discontented on sundry pretexts for the space of two years before the unlucky occasion of the succeeding war happened, yet His Excellency our Governor neglected the proper measures to reconcile the wavering savages, till the gentleman who was appointed to succeed him had just reached the American coast. Then, indeed, he set off, with a considerable number of gentlemen, in flourishing parade, and went as far as ninety-six settlement, from whence, as most probably he expected, he was fortunately recalled, and joyfully superseded. I saw him on his way up, and plainly observed he was unprovided for the journey, it must unavoidably have proved abortive before he could have proceeded through the Chirate country, gratifying the inquisitive disposition of the people, as he went, and quieting the jealous minds of the inhabitants of those towns, who are settled among the Apollock Mountains, and those seven towns, in particular, that lie beyond them. He neither sent before, nor carried with him, any presents wherewith to suit the natives, and his kind promises and smooth speeches would have weighed exceedingly light in the Indian scale. So called from its distance of miles from the Chirik. Adair makes a slight slip here. Ninety-six was the name applied as early as 1730, to the point ninety-six miles from Charlestown. Sally, George Hunter's Map of 1730, page. 3. Having shown the bad state of our affairs among the remotest parts of the Chiray country, and the causes. I shall now relate their plea, for commencing war against the British colonies, and the great danger we were exposed to by the incessant intrigues of the half-savage French garrisons in those hot times, when all our northern barriers were so prodigiously harassed. Several companies of the Chirake, who joined our forces under General Stanwix at the unfortunate Ohio, affirmed that their alienation from us was, because they were confined to our martial arrangement by unjust suspicion of them, were very much contemned and half-starved at the main camp, their hearts told them, therefore, to return home as freemen and injured allies, though without a supply of provisions. This they did, and pinching hunger forced them to take as much as barely supported nature when returning to their own country. In their journey, the German inhabitants, without any provocation, killed in cool blood about forty of their warriors in different places, though each party was under the command of a British subject. They scalped all and butchered several, after a most shocking manner, in imitation of the barbarous war custom of the savages, some who escaped the carnage returned at night to see their kindred and war companions, and reported their fate. Among those who were thus treated, some were leading men, which had a dangerous tendency to disturb the public quiet. 
we were repeatedly informed, by public account, that those murderers were so audacious as to impose the scalps on the government for those of French Indians, and that they actually obtained the premium allowed at that time by law in such a case. Although the vindictive disposition of Indians in general impetuously forces them on in quest of equal revenge for blood, without the least thought of consequences, yet as a misunderstanding had subsisted some time between several distant towns and those who chanced to lose their people in Virginia, the chiefs of those families being afraid of a civil war in case of a rupture with us, dissuaded the furious young warriors from commencing hostilities against us till they had demanded satisfaction, agreeable to the treaty of friendship between them and our colonies, which if denied, they would fully take of their own accord, as became a free, warlike, and injured people. In this state, the affair lay, for the best part of a year, without our using any proper conciliating measures to prevent the threatening impending storm from destroying us. During that interval, they earnestly applied to Virginia for satisfaction, without receiving any, in like manner to North Carolina, and afterwards to South Carolina, with the same bad success. And there was another incident at Fort Prince George, which set fire to the fuel, and kindled it into a raging flame, three light-headed, disorderly young officers of that. Garrison forcibly violated some of their wives, and in the most shameless manner, at their own houses, while the husbands were making their winter hunt in the woods, and which infamous conduct they madly repeated, but a few months before the commencement of the war, in other respects, through a haughty overbearing spirit, they took pleasure in insulting and abusing the natives, when they paid a friendly visit to the garrison. No wonder that such a behavior caused their revengeful tempers to burst forth into action. When the Indians find no redress of grievances, they never fail to redress themselves either sooner or later. But when they begin, they do not know where to end. Their thirst for the blood of their reputed enemies is not to be quenched with a few drops. The more they drink, the more it inflames their thirst. When they dip their fingers in human blood, they are restless till they plunge themselves in it. Contrary to the wise conduct of the French garrisons in securing the affection of the natives where they are settled, our sons of Mars embittered the hearts of those Chirik that lie next to South Carolina and Georgia colonies against us with the mid-settlements and the western towns on the streams of the Mississippi, who were so incensed as continually to upbraid the traitors with our unkind treatment of their people in the camp at Monongahela and for our having committed such. Hostilities against our good friends, who were peaceably returning home through our settlements, and often under pinching wants. The lying over their dead, and the wailing of the women in their various towns, and tribes, for their deceased relations, at the dawn of day, and in the dusk of the evening, proved another strong provocative to them to retaliate blood for blood. The Muscogee also at that time having a friendly intercourse with the Chirik through the channel of the governor of South Carolina were, at the instance of the watchful French, often ridiculing them for their cowardice and not revenging the crying blood of their beloved kinsmen and warriors. At the same time, they promised to assist them against us, and in the name of the Alabama French, assured them of a supply of ammunition to enable them to avenge their injuries and maintain their lives and liberties against the mischievous and bloody English colonists, who, they said, were naturally in a bitter state of war against all the red people and studied only how to steal their lands, on a quite opposite principle to the open steady conduct of the generous French, who assist their poor red brothers a great way from their own settlements where they can have no view, but that of doing good. Notwithstanding the repeated provocations we had given to the Chirik and the artful insinuations of the French, inculcated with proper address, yet their old chiefs, not wholly depending on the sincerity of their smooth tongues and painted faces, nor on the assistance or even neutrality of the remote northern towns of their own country on mature deliberation, concluded that, as all hopes of a friendly redress for the blood of their relations now depended on their own hands, they ought to take revenge in that equal and just manner, which became good warriors. They accordingly sent out a large company of warriors against those Germans, or tied arse people, as they termed them, to bring in an equal number of their scalps to those of their own murdered relations. Or if they found their safety did not permit, they were to proceed as near to that settlement as they conveniently could, where having taken sufficient satisfaction, they were to bury the bloody tomahawk they took with them. They set off, 
but advancing pretty far into the high settlements of North Carolina, the ambitious young leaders separated into small companies and killed as many of our people as unfortunately fell into their power, contrary to the wise orders of their seniors, and the number far exceeded that of their own slain. Soon after they returned home, they killed a reprobate old trader, and two soldiers also were cut off near Fort Loudoun. For these acts of hostility, the government of South Carolina demanded satisfaction without receiving any. The hearts of their young warriors were so exceedingly enraged as to render their ears quite deaf to any remonstrance of their seniors, respecting an amicable accommodation, for as they expected to be exposed to very little danger on our remote, dispersed, and very extensive barrier settlements, nothing but parade, and he proceeded in his circular course, in the same retired easy manner, without incommoding any of the inhabitants. He fully testified, his sole aim was the security and welfare of the valuable country over which he presided, without imitating the mean self-interested artifice of any predecessor. At the capital seat of government, he busily employed himself in extending and protecting trade, the vital part of a maritime colony, in redressing old neglected grievances of various kinds, and punishing corruption wheresoever it was found, beginning at the head, and proceeding equally to the feet, and in protecting virtue, not by the former cobweb laws, but those of old British extraction. In so laudable a manner did that public-spirited governor exert his powers in his own proper sphere of action, but on an object much below it, he failed by not knowing aright the temper and customs of the savages. The war being commenced on both sides, by the aforesaid complicated causes, it continued for some time a partial one, and according to the well-known temper of the Chirik in similar cases, it might either have remained so, or soon have been changed into a very hot civil war, had we been so wise as to have improved the favorable opportunity. There were seven northern towns, opposite to the middle parts of the Chirik country, who from the beginning of the unhappy grievances, firmly dissented from the hostile intentions of their suffering. And enraged countrymen, and for a considerable time before, bore them little good will, on account of some family disputes, which occasioned each party to be more favorable to itself than to the other, these would readily have gratified their vindictive disposition either by a neutrality or an offensive alliance with our colonists against them. Our rivals the French never neglected so favorable an opportunity of securing and promoting their interests. We have known more than one instance wherein their wisdom has not only found out proper means to disconcert the most dangerous plans of disaffected savages, but likewise to foment and artfully encourage great animosities between the heads of ambitious rival families till they fixed them in an implacable hatred against each other and all of their respective tribes. Had the French been under such circumstances as we then were, they would instantly have sent them an embassy by a proper person, to enforce it by the persuasive argument of interest, well supported with presents to all the leading men, in order to make it weigh heavy in the Indian scale, and would have invited a number of those towns to pay them a brotherly visit, whenever it suited them, that they might shake hands, smoke out of the white, or beloved pipe, and drink physic together as became old friends of honest hearts, etc. Had we thus done, many valuable and innocent persons might have been saved from the torturing hands of the enraged Indians. The favorite leading warrior of those friendly towns was well known to South Carolina and Georgia by the trading name Round O, on account of a blue impression he bore in that form. The same old, brave, and friendly warrior, depending firmly on our friendship and usual good faith, came down within a hundred miles of Charlestown, along with the headmen and many others of those towns, to declare to the government an inviolable attachment to all our British colonies under every various circumstance of life whatsoever, and at the same time, earnestly to request them to supply their present want of ammunition and order the commanding officer of Fort Prince. George to continue to do them the like service, when necessity should force them to apply for it, as they were fully determined to war to the very last, against all the enemies of Carolina, without regarding who they were, or the number they consisted of. This they told me on the spot, for having been in a singular manner recommended to His Excellency the General, I was pre-engaged for that campaign, but as I could not obtain orders to go ahead of the army, through the woods, with a body of the Chikasa, and commence hostilities, I declined the affair. 
Had our valuable and well-meaning Chirake friends just mentioned acted their usual part of evading captivity, it would have been much better for them and many hundreds of our unfortunate outsettlers, but they depending on our usual good faith by their honest credulity were ruined. It was well known that the Indians are unacquainted with the custom and meaning of hostages. To them, it conveyed the idea of slaves, as they have no public faith to secure the lives of such, yet they were taken into custody, kept in close confinement, and afterwards shot dead. Their mortal crime consisted in sounding the war whoop and hollowing to their countrymen when attacking the fort in which they were imprisoned, to fight like strong-hearted warriors, and they would soon carry it against the cowardly traitors who deceived and enslaved their friends in their own beloved country. A white savage on this cut threw a plank over their heads and perpetrated that horrid action while the soldiery were employed like warriors against the enemy to excuse his baseness and save himself from the reproaches of the people. He, like the wolf in the fable, falsely accused them of intending to poison the wells of the garrison. By our uniform misconduct, we gave too plausible a plea to the disaffected part of the Muscogee to join the Chirik, and at the same time fixed the whole nation in a state of war against us. All the families of those leading men that were so shamefully murdered were inexpressibly embittered against our very national name, judging that we first deceived, then enslaved, and afterwards killed our best and most faithful friends, who were firmly resolved to die in our defense. The means of our general safety thus returned to our general ruin. The mixed body of people that were first sent against them were too weak to do them any ill, and they soon returned home with a wild, ridiculous parade. There were frequent desertions among them, some were afraid of the smallpox, which then raged in the country, others abhorred an inactive life. This fine silken body chiefly consisted of citizens and planters from the low settlements, unacquainted with the hardships of a woodland, savage war, and in case of an ambuscade attack, were utterly incapable of standing the shock. In Georgiana, we were assured by a gentleman of character, a principal merchant of Mobile, who went a volunteer on that expedition, that toward the conclusion of it, when he went round the delicate camp, in wet weather, and late at night, he saw in different places from fifteen to twenty of their guns in a cluster, at the distance of an equal number of paces from their tents, seemingly so rusty and peaceable, as the loss of them by the usual sudden attack of Indian savages, could not in the least affect their lives and the Chirag nation were sensible of their innocent intentions from the disposition of the expedition in so late a season of the year, but their own bad situation by the ravaging smallpox and the danger of a civil war induced the lower towns to lie dormant. However, soon after our people returned home, they firmly united in the generous cause of liberty, and they acted their part so well that our traitors suspected not the impending blow till the moment they fatally felt it, some indeed escaped by the assistance of the Indians. In brief, we forced the Chirake to become our bitter enemies by a long train of wrong measures, the consequences of which were severely felt by a number of high assessed, ruined, and bleeding innocents. May this relation be a lasting caution to our colonies against the like fatal errors and induce them, whenever necessity compels, to go well prepared, with plenty of fit stores, and men, against any Indian nation, and first defeat, and then treat with them. It concerns us to remember, that they neither show mercy to those who fall in their power, by the chance of war, nor keep good faith with their enemies, unless they are feelingly convinced of its reasonableness, and civilly treated afterward. Had South Carolina exerted herself in due time against them, as her situation required, it would have saved a great deal of innocent blood and public treasure. Common sense directed them to make immediate preparations for carrying the war into their country as the only way to conquer them, but they strangely neglected sending warlike stores to 96, our only barrier fort, and even providing horses and carriages for that needful occasion till the troops they requested arrived. From New York, and then they sent only a trifling number of those, and our provincials, under the gallant colonel. Montgomery, now Lord Eglinton. His twelve hundred brave, hardy Highlanders, though but a handful, were much abler, however, to fight the Indians in their country than six thousand heavy accoutred and slow-moving regulars, for these, with our provincials, could both fight and pursue, while the regulars would always be surrounded and stand a sure and shining mark. 
Except a certain provincial captain who escorted the cattle, every officer and private man in this expedition imitated the intrepid copy of their martial leader, but being too few in number, and withal scanty of provisions, and having lost many men at a narrow pass, called Crow's Creek, where the path leads by the side of a river, below a dangerous steep mountain, they proceeded only a few miles, to a fine situated town called Nukwos, and then wisely retreated under cover of the night toward Fort Prince George and returned to Charlestown in August 1760. Seven months after the Chirate commenced hostilities, South Carolina by her ill-timed parsimony again exposed her barriers to the merciless ravages of the enraged Indians, who reckoning themselves also superior to any resistance we could make, swept along the valuable outsettlements of North Carolina and Virginia, and like evil ones licensed to destroy, ruined their offensive and defensive tree. But, notwithstanding our dangerous situation ought to have directed any gentleman worthy of public trust to have immediately proceeded to their country to regain the hearts of those fickle and daring savages and thereby elude the deep-laid plan of the French, and though Indian runners were frequently sent down by our old friendly headman, urging the absolute necessity of his coming up soon, otherwise it would be too late. He trifled away near half a year there, and in places adjoining and raising a body of men with a proud uniform dress for the sake of parade and to escort him from danger with swivels, blunderbusses, and many other such sorts of blundering stuff before he proceeded on his journey. This was the only way to expose the gentleman to real danger by showing at such a time a diffidence of the natives which he accordingly affected merely by his pride, obstinacy, and unskillfulness. It is well known, the whole might have been prevented if he had listened to the entreaties of the Indian traders of that place to request one who would neither refuse nor delay to serve his country on any important occasion to go in his stead as the dangerous situation of our affairs demanded quick dispatch. But pride prevented, and he slowly reached there after much time was lost. The artful French commander had in the meanwhile a very good opportunity to distract the giddy savages, and he wisely took advantage of the delay, and persuaded a considerable body of the Shawano Indians to fly to the northward, as our chief was affirmed to be coming with an army and train of artillery to cut them off, in revenge of the blood they had formerly spilled. We soon heard that in their way, they murdered a great many of the British subjects, and with the most despiteful eagerness committed their bloody ravages during the whole war. After the headmen of that far-extending country were convened to know the import of our intendant's long-expected embassy, he detained them from day to day with his parading grandeur, not using the Indian-friendly freedom either to the red or white people, till provisions grew scanty. Then their hearts were embittered against him, while the French Alabama commander was busy and taking time by the forelock. But the former, to be uniform in his stiff, haughty conduct, crowned the whole in a longer delay, and almost gained a supposed crown of martyrdom by prohibiting, in an obstinate manner, all the war chieftains and beloved men then assembled together in the great beloved square, from handing the friendly white pipe to a certain great war leader, well known by the names of Yaya Testanich or the Great Mortar, because he had been in the French interest. Our great man ought to have reclaimed him by strong reasoning and good treatment, but by his misconduct he inflamed the hearts of him and his relations with the bitterest enmity against the English name, so that when the gentleman was proceeding in his laconic style, a warrior who had always before been very kind to the British traders, called the Tobacco Eater, on account of his chewing tobacco, jumped up in a rage and darted his tomahawk at his head, happily for all the traitors. Present, and our frontier colonies, it sunk in a plank directly over the superintendent, and while the tobacco eater was eagerly pulling it out, to give the mortal blow, a warrior, friendly to the English, immediately leaped up, saved the gentleman, and prevented those dangerous consequences which must otherwise have immediately followed. Had the aimed blow succeeded, the savages would have immediately put up the war and death whoop, destroyed most of the white people there on the spot, and set off in great bodies, both to the Chirate country and against our valuable settlements. Soon after that gentleman returned to Carolina, the great mortar persuaded a party of his relations to kill our traitors, and they murdered ten, very fortunately, it stopped there for that time. 
but at the close of the Great Congress at Augusta, where four governors of our colonies and His Majesty's superintendent convened the savages and renewed and confirmed the Treaty of Peace, the same disaffected warrior returning home sent off a party who murdered 14 of the inhabitants of Long Cane Settlement above 96. The result of that dangerous Congress tempted the proud savages to act such a part as they were tamely forgiven and unasked all their former scenes of blood. During this distracted period, the French used their utmost endeavors to involve us in a general Indian war, which to have saved South Carolina and Georgia would probably have required the assistance of a considerable number of our troops from Canada. They strove to supply the Chirig, by way of the Mississippi, with warlike stores, and also sent them powder, bullets, flints, knives, and red paint by their staunch friend, the disaffected Great Mortar, and his adherents. And though they failed in executing their mischievous plan, both on account of the manly escape of our traitors and the wise conduct of those below, they did not despair. Upon studious deliberation, they concluded that, if the aforesaid chieftain Yahya Tustinich, his family, and warriors settled high up one of their leading rivers, about halfway toward the Chirik, it would prove the only means then left of promoting their general cause against the British colonists, and, as the lands were good for hunting, the river shallow, and abounding with saltish grass, for the deer to feed on in the heat of the day, free of troublesome insects, and as. The stream glided by the Alabama garrison to Mobile, at that time in the French hands, it could not well fail to decoy a great many of the ambitious young warriors, and others, to go there and join our enemies, on any occasion which appeared most conducive to the design of shedding blood, and getting a higher name among their wolfish heroes. He and his numerous pack, confident of success, and of receiving the French supplies by water, set off for their new seat, well loaded, both for their Chirake friends and themselves. He had a French commission, with plenty of beeswax, and decoying pictures, and a flourishing flag, which in dry weather was displayed day and night in the middle of their anti-Anglican theater. It in a great measure answered the serpentine design of the French, for it became the general rendezvous of the Mississippi Indians, the Chirake, and the more mischievous part of the Muscogee. The latter became the French carriers to those highland savages, and had they received the ammunition sent them by water, and that nest been allowed to continue, we should have had the French on our southern colonies at the head of a dreadful confederated army of savages, carrying desolation wherever they went. But, the plan miscarried, our friendly gallant Chikasa, being well informed of the ill design of this nest of hornets, broke it up. A considerable company of their resolute warriors marched against it, and, as they readily knew the place of the great mortar's residence, they attacked it, and though they missed him, they killed his brother. This so greatly intimidated him and his clan that they suddenly removed from thence, and their favorite plan was abortive. When he got near to a place of safety, he showed how highly irritated he was against us and our allies. His disappointment and disgrace prevented him from returning to his own native town and excited him to settle in the remotest and most northern one of the whole nation. Toward the Chirake, in order to assist them as far as the French and his own corroding temper might enable him against the innocent objects of his enmity, and during the continuance of the war we held with those savages, he and a numerous party of his adherents kept passing and repassing from thence to the bloody theater. They were there, as their loud insulting bravados testified during our two before-mentioned campaigns under Honorable Colonel Montgomery and Major Grant. The wise endeavors of Governor Bull of South Carolina and the unwearied application of Governor Ellis of Georgia in concert with the gentlemen of two great trading houses, the one at Augusta and the other on the Carolina side of the river, not far below, where the Indians crowded day and night, greatly contributed to demolish the plan of the French and their ally, the Great Mortar. When public spirit, that divine spark, glows in the breast of any of the American leaders, it never fails to communicate its influence all around, even to the savages in the remotest wilderness, of which Governor Ellis is an illustrious instance. He speedily reconciled a jarring colony, calmed the raging Muscogee, though set on by the mischievous Alabama French, pacified the Chirake, and the rest of their confederates, sent them off well pleased, without executing their base design, and engaged them into a neutrality. 
The following is one instance. As soon as the Indians killed our traders, they sent runners to call home their people from our settlements. A friendly head warrior who had noticed of it at night near Augusta came the next day with a few more, expressed his sorrow for the mischief his countrymen had done us, protested he never had any ill intentions against us, and said that, though by the law of blood, he ought to die, yet, if we allowed him to live as a friend, he should. Live and die one. Though thousands of regular troops would most probably have been totally cut off had they been where the intended general massacre began, without an assortment of our provincials, yet an unskillful, haughty officer of Fort Augusta labored hard for killing this warrior and his companion, which of course would have brought on what the enemy sought, a complicated, universal war. But His Excellency's humane temper and wise conduct Actuating the Indian trading gentlemen of Augusta, they suffered him to set off to strive to prevent the further effusion of innocent blood, and thus procured the happy fruits of peace to the infant colonies of Georgia and South Carolina. Their Offensive and Defensive Treaty but, notwithstanding our dangerous situation ought to have directed any gentleman worthy of public trust to have immediately proceeded to their country to regain the hearts of those fickle and daring savages and thereby elude the deep-laid plan of the French, and though Indian runners were frequently sent down by our old friendly headman, urging the absolute necessity of his coming up soon, otherwise it would be too late. He trifled away near half a year there, and in places adjoining. In raising a body of men with a proud uniform dress for the sake of parade and to escort him from danger with swivels, blunderbusses, and many other such sorts of blundering stuff before he proceeded on his journey. This was the only way to expose the gentleman to real danger by showing at such a time a diffidence of the natives which he accordingly affected merely by his pride, obstinacy, and unskillfulness. It is well known the whole might have been prevented if he had listened to the entreaties of the Indian traders of that place to request one who would neither refuse nor delay to serve his country on any important occasion to go in his stead as the dangerous situation of our affairs demanded quick dispatch. But pride prevented, and he slowly reached there after much time was lost. The artful French commander had in the meanwhile a very good opportunity to distract the giddy savages, and he wisely took advantage of the delay, and persuaded a considerable body of the Shawano Indians to fly to the northward, as our chief was affirmed to be coming with an army and train of artillery to cut them off, in revenge of the blood they had formerly spilled. We soon heard that in their way, they murdered a great many of the British subjects, and with the most despiteful eagerness committed their bloody ravages during the whole war. After the headmen of that far-extending country were convened to know the import of our intendant's long-expected embassy, he detained them from day to day with his parading grandeur, not using the Indian-friendly freedom either to the red or white people, till provisions grew scanty. Then their hearts were embittered against him, while the French Alabama commander was busy and taking time by the forelock. But the former, to be uniform in his stiff, haughty conduct, crowned the whole in a longer delay, and almost gained a supposed crown of martyrdom by prohibiting, in an obstinate manner, all the war chieftains and beloved men then assembled together in the great beloved square, from handing the friendly white pipe to a certain great war leader, well known by the names of Yaya Testanich or the Great Mortar, because he had been in the French interest. Our great man ought to have reclaimed him by strong reasoning and good treatment, but by his misconduct he inflamed the hearts of him and his relations with the bitterest enmity against the English name, so that when the gentleman was proceeding in his laconic style, a warrior who had always before been very kind to the British traders, called the Tobacco Eater, on account of his chewing tobacco, jumped up in a rage and darted his tomahawk at his head, happily for all the traders. Present, and our frontier colonies, it sunk in a plank directly over the superintendent, and while the tobacco eater was eagerly pulling it out, to give the mortal blow, a warrior, friendly to the English, immediately leaped up, saved the gentleman, and prevented those dangerous consequences which must otherwise have immediately followed. Had the aimed blow succeeded, the savages would have immediately put up the war and death whoop, destroyed most of the white people there on the spot, and set off in great bodies, both to the Chirate country and against our valuable settlements. 
Soon after that gentleman returned to Carolina, the Great Mortar persuaded a party of his relations to kill our traitors, and they murdered ten. Very fortunately, it stopped there for that time. But at the close of the Great Congress at Augusta, where four governors of our colonies and His Majesty's superintendent convened the savages and renewed and confirmed the Treaty of Peace, the same disaffected warrior returning home sent off a party who murdered 14 of the inhabitants of Long Cane Settlement above 96. The result of that dangerous Congress tempted the proud savages to act such a part as they were tamely forgiven and unasked all their former scenes of blood. During this distracted period, the French used their utmost endeavors to involve us in a general Indian war, which to have saved South Carolina and Georgia would probably have required the assistance of a considerable number of our troops from Canada. They strove to supply the Chirik, by way of the Mississippi, with warlike stores, and also sent them powder, bullets, flints, knives, and red paint by their staunch friend, the disaffected Great Mortar, and his adherents. And though they failed in executing their mischievous plan, both on account of the manly escape of our traitors and the wise conduct of those below, they did not despair. Upon studious deliberation, they concluded that, if the aforesaid chieftain Yahya Tustinich, his family, and warriors settled high up one of their leading rivers about halfway toward the Chirake, it would prove the only means then left of promoting their general cause against the British colonists, and, as the lands were good for hunting, the river shallow, and abounding with saltish grass, for the deer to feed on in the heat of the day, free of troublesome insects, and as. The stream glided by the Alabama garrison to Mobile, at that time in the French hands, it could not well fail to decoy a great many of the ambitious young warriors, and others, to go there and join our enemies, on any occasion which appeared most conducive to the design of shedding blood, and getting a higher name among their wolfish heroes. He and his numerous pack, confident of success, and of receiving the French supplies by water, set off for their new seat, well loaded, both for their Chirake friends and themselves. He had a French commission, with plenty of beeswax, and decoying pictures, and a flourishing flag, which in dry weather was displayed day and night in the middle of their anti-Anglican theater. It in a great measure answered the serpentine design of the French, for it became the general rendezvous of the Mississippi Indians, the Chirake, and the more mischievous part of the Muscogee. The latter became the French carriers to those highland savages, and had they received the ammunition sent them by water, and that nest been allowed to continue, we should have had the French on our southern colonies at the head of a dreadful confederated army of savages, carrying desolation wherever they went. But, the plan miscarried, our friendly gallant Chikasa, being well informed of the ill design of this nest of hornets, broke it up. A considerable company of their resolute warriors marched against it, and, as they readily knew the place of the great mortar's residence, they attacked it, and though they missed him, they killed his brother. This so greatly intimidated him and his clan that they suddenly removed from thence, and their favorite plan was abortive. When he got near to a place of safety, he showed how highly irritated he was against us and our allies. His disappointment and disgrace prevented him from returning to his own native town and excited him to settle in the remotest and most northern one of the whole nation. Toward the Chirake, in order to assist them, as far as the French and his own corroding temper might enable him against the innocent objects of his enmity, and during the continuance of the war we held with those savages, he and a numerous party of his adherents kept passing and repassing from thence to the bloody theater. They were there, as their loud insulting bravados testified during our two before-mentioned campaigns under Honorable Colonel Montgomery and Major Grant. The wise endeavors of Governor Bull of South Carolina and the unwearied application of Governor Ellis of Georgia in concert with the gentlemen of two great trading houses, the one at Augusta and the other on the Carolina side of the river, not far below, where the Indians crowded day and night, greatly contributed to demolish the plan of the French and their ally, the Great Mortar. When public spirit, that divine spark, glows in the breast of any of the American leaders, it never fails to communicate its influence, all around, even to the savages in the remotest wilderness, of which Governor Ellis is an illustrious instance. 
he speedily reconciled a jarring colony, calmed the raging Muscogee, though set on by the mischievous Alabama French, pacified the Chirake, and the rest of their confederates, sent them off well pleased, without executing their base design, and engaged them into a neutrality. The following is one instance, as soon as the Indians killed our traders, they sent runners to call home their people, from our settlements, a friendly head warrior, who had noticed of it at night, near Augusta, came the next day with a few more, expressed his sorrow for the mischief his countrymen had done us, protested he never had any ill intentions against us, and said that, though by the law of blood, he ought to die, yet, if we allowed him to live as a friend, he should. Live and die one. Though thousands of regular troops would most probably have been totally cut off, had they been where the intended general massacre began, without an assortment of our provincials, yet an unskillful, haughty officer of Fort Augusta labored hard for killing this warrior, and his companion, which of course, would have brought on what the enemy sought, a complicated, universal war. But His Excellency's humane temper, and wise conduct, Actuating the Indian trading gentlemen of Augusta, they suffered him to set off to strive to prevent the further effusion of innocent blood, and thus procured the happy fruits of peace to the infant colonies of Georgia and South Carolina. If you've been to this channel more than once, please subscribe as it truly does help the channel. Leave a comment for the bang looks forward to reading them and replying to them. Also, don't forget to like and share this content with like-minded individuals such as yourself. There is plenty more where this came from. Until next time, this bang content will end in 3, 2, 1.